Good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, we can cheer We're going to go ahead and get started here to because uh, Dr. Seashore wants to give you plenty of time at the end for question and answer. So I've got a uh, an introduction here, um, maybe a little bit lengthy, but I think it's good for you to hear what all he's done in his um, relatively brief academic career. <laughs> so, he is a general academic pediatrician and he's currently medical director of the newborn ser service at North Carolina Women's Hospital. He attended Yale School of Medicine graduating in 2000 and completed his residency in pediatrics at the Massachusetts General Hospital for Children in Boston in 03. He remained in Boston until 08, serving as a primary care pediatrician and faculty member, and he was also director of the pediatric hospitalist program there at Mass General for the last three years of his stay there. In 08, he joined the University of North Carolina faculty in general pediatrics and adolescent medicine as a clinical assistant professor, and this year he achieved the rank of clinical professor. Congratulations. Thank you. He was the medical director of the UNC Pediatric Diagnostic Service his first seven years and became the medical director of the newborn nursery in 2010. In 2013, he also became EPIC lead informatics physician. He's a member of AOA Medical Honor Society. He won the intern teaching award at Cambridge Hospital in 01. He won the Family Centered Care Award at Mass General in 04, and he's a graduate of the Teaching Scholars Program at UNC School of Medicine, and that was in 2011. He has numerous refereed papers and articles related to the care of newborns, with several most recently related to neonatal abstinence syndrome, which is something that caught my eye because we're dealing with that more and more here. He has taught, twice taught workshops at the Academic Pediatric Association Region 4 meetings and just completed his tenure as the APA's Region 4 co-chair. He's currently a member of the APA Born Research Committee, which is a nationally elected position to Born, which stands for Better Outcomes Through Research for Newborns. He has given numerous presentations at UNC as well as elsewhere, most recently on the topic that we'll be hearing about today. In 2014, he was awarded a $6.6 million grant for three years from the she CDC. Was. She got she back was. Well, it's Our team got that. Co I yes, was a co, -wise. co -wise. Yeah. That's right, co investigator. <laughs> from the CDC for breastfeeding, implementing and identifying the best practices for achieving baby-friendly USA designation. With that grant, he serves as a physician champion, quality improvement coach, and informatics expert. He's been brought here today as an Empower Breastfeeding Coach. Empower Breastfeeding is a hospital-based quality improvement initiative focusing on maternity practices leading to baby-friendly designation. This initiative is funded by the CDC's Division of Nutrition, Physical Activity, and Obesity. This division is committed to increasing breastfeeding rates throughout the U.S. and is also committed to promoting and supporting optimal breastfeeding practices toward the ultimate goal of improving the public's health. I'd now like to present Dr. Carl Seashore, who today will be presenting this topic. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, well, thank, thank you all for having me. A, a point of clarification. I, I'm not the, the principal investigator on the CDC Empower grant. I'm one of the co-investigators. But that, that grant was awarded to a, a three-pronged team that's comprised of the Population Health Improvement Partners Group in Raleigh, North Carolina, which is an offshoot of the UNC School of Medicine the Carolina Global Breastfeeding Institute uh, at our School of Public Health and APT Associates, which is the program manager for that. So I'm a little itty bitty part of that grant, but uh, I'm thrilled to be here today under the auspices of the Empower program. Just real quick show of hands, how many folks are residents in the room? So I know who all are here. And then any fellows, medical students, outstanding, and pediatricians, faculty, nurse practitioners? At least one nurse practitioner. Um, and then any family medicine or OB or other folks? Hooray! <laughs> <laughs> Representing. Excellent. <clears throat> well, we'll try to touch on a broad array of topics. But as mentioned, the Empower um, Project is a national quality improvement collaborative that's um, targeting initially 100 hospitals, of which 93 are still actively participating into the third year, um, to really look at the uh, practices and processes around supporting um, women and breastfeeding and just general 
um, evidence-based care during the postpartum stay. Um, and your hospital was one of the one of the lucky institutions that applied to that program to be a site for Empower. Um, and so your leadership here had to go through a peer review rigorous process of applying to be an Empower hospital um, and won that grant. And so with that comes our team for three years. And that's including um, breastfeeding content expertise coaching as well as quality improvement coaching. So using structured methodologies to bring about practice change. Um, and then a lot of sort of high level um, institutional and administrative support on working through the, the challenges of, this, of achieving baby-friendly designation. And so what I hope to cover today is really not just the nitty-gritty of what baby-friendly means and the process that you all are going through as an institution, but really the bigger picture of what uh, breast milk feeding means uh, not only for child health, which uh, the majority of this audience is focused on, but also maternal health. Um, with a little bit of a foray into some, some other uh, public health um, and cost-related outcomes that we've found um, through this project. And so, you know, my day job is that I round in the nursery on a pretty regular basis with our team of residents, nurse practitioners, medical students, very much like uh, what I saw when, I, when we took our tour this morning that you all do here. Very similar model of uh, rooming in postpartum care, moms and babies staying together when both are healthy. Um, and I do that with residents and students every day. So I'm very much in the, in the weeds with this um, and uh, have experienced a lot of the challenges and frustrations and successes of, of going through this, through this process. Our hospital was designated in 2012 um, and we were very fortunate to have the folks from Carolina Global Breastfeeding Institute next door um, help us through that before things like Empower existed. So that's the, the background that I come with. As far as disclosures, I am a humble, poor pediatrician and have none. Um, and I won't be talking about any off-label or experimental investigational drugs uh, today, unlike when we have NAS on the docket. So we're doing CME. CME, you got to have learning objectives. That's one of the requirements. So here they are. Um, we're going to tr try to break this down into three main sections today. One is talking about the importance of human milk feeding, again, not only for infant health outcomes, but also maternal health outcomes. And so what's the biology here? What are the outcomes that we're potentially impacting? And then how are we doing as a country, right? How are we doing nationally compared to our global uh, peers? And then how are we doing um, on a state by state and regional level in the United States? Um, and then we'll finish up talking about what baby friendly hospital is, um, a lot about what baby friendly hospital isn't, um, and thinking about ways that we can change, go about changing our practice or improving our practice. Um, to support evidence-based uh, interventions that can help our moms and babies uh, do well in that regard. So human milk feeding, moms and babies. So why breastfeeding? Why is this something that we're talking about today? Um, so every major health organization in the world, not just the AP here in the United States or ACOG or AFP, but really the World Health Organization and, and any, any body that makes a recommendation around the globe agrees and understands that human milk is the, is the best choice for moms and babies. The reasons are different depending on where you are. So if you're in Africa or India in a more developing part of the world, the risks of not um, breastfeeding or not having successful breeding, breastfeeding are different, right? It's, it's clean water or safe formula or an alternative to breast milk that's not as readily available as we have it here in the United States. If you're in Shreveport or Chapel Hill, or you know, uh, the farm country of California, it's different challenges. The populations that you're feeding, is it low income challenges? Is it health problems in the mom? Um, but regardless of all that, everybody agrees this is the right thing for moms and babies. And really as a country, we don't do that well. Um, the United States is not leading the world in breastfeeding outcomes or health outcomes in general for that matter. Um, and one of the more uh, striking graphs I've seen recently is the amount we spend versus our outcomes truly makes us an outlier on the global stage. Um, and this is potentially a piece of that larger puzzle. Um, and then from a public health perspective, if you think if anyone's done any MPH coursework, uh, the primary, secondary, and tertiary, tertiary prevention and health benefits for both mom and baby human milk feeding has been shown to have benefits in all of those realms. And so this is really something that can that can cross the lifespan and the, and the impacts of health outcomes aren't just one simple endpoint. They really are quite broad. Um, and then the last piece is that the cost savings here are really potentially huge. 
Um, if you think about the cost of our current epidemics of obesity and diabetes in older folks, if we can even make a dent in that um, by improving uh, breastfeeding outcomes, then, then the potential downstream uh, cost effects here are really, really immense. Um, <clears throat> so here we are. This is a graph of uh, breastfeeding outcomes uh, from 2004 through 2012. This comes from uh, the Economic Cooperation and Development Organization. Um, and this is uh, looking at percentage of exclusive breastfeeding through three months of age. Okay, So if you look at the tallest bar there, that's Hungary. Um, and there's a whole lot of breastfeeding going on in Hungary. I think we could all do well to go study what they're doing in Hungary and trying to understand why they have such phenomenal outcomes there compared to the other countries in the study. And then you have kind of a run of your Scandinavian countries who are always held out as leaders in some of these public health uh, spheres. And then the United States is, is plucked out on the side there, but clearly not the highest performer, with only about 35% of infants being uh, exclusively breastfed through three months of age. Lots of systemic and public health reasons for that. Um, and we're doing better than some of our peers on the other side of the pond, but clearly there's some room for improvement here. Um, here's one of our slides from the Empower Project. This is to highlight that primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention. Um, if you think about primary prevention, you're protecting someone from getting a disease. You're wearing your seatbelt. You're counseling about bicycle helmets in the well child clinic. You're giving immunizations. You're taking somebody who's well now, and you're keeping them that way despite some adverse thing that might come along. So you're protecting against the development of disease or illness. Secondary prevention is you're slowing something down, right? You're thinking about, um, okay, we've got something here. Let's try to mitigate that. So that's, you know, you're treating an illness. You're uh, doing a weight loss intervention. You're, you're intervening because there's already a problem to be addressed. And then tertiary prevention is really the management of long-term complicated problems. Um, and human milk feeding for both moms and babies has been shown here um, to have benefits. So how many of y'all been through the NICU, the residents in the room? Do y'all use human milk in the NICU? Do you talk about it at all as far as... What are some of the outcomes that it's been shown to benefit in the, in the little wee neonates? Be confident. That's right. Be confident. Less net. Yeah. So that's definitely the biggest outcome where, where human milk has been shown to be truly life saving, right? Not just morbidity, but also mortality. Um, and so that's just one example of where this, is, where this has been shown to be um, beneficial. If you think about some of the maternal health outcomes, you know, breast cancer rates, um, obesity, type 2 diabetes, things like that are improved in mothers um, who've breastfed their infants versus not. So across the lifespan, across maternal and child health, we've got huge potential impacts that are going unrecognized for two-thirds or so of our population right now. Um, as far as the cost savings, I think this is actually one of the most dramatic things. So uh, Archives of Diseases of Childhood, that's a, a, a journal that I'll read from time to time. Um, and this was a study out of the UK looking at just four acute diseases in children um, that annually were almost 90 million pounds. And I don't know what the pound exchange rate is now, but it's, I think, worth more than a dollar. Um, and then they did some, you know, the, the quality of life uh, calculations, that sort of thing. But if you're talking about improving breastfeeding rates in, in that population um, and just the outcomes of the infectious diseases in childhood, um, you were talking about um, almost, uh, almost a billion pounds in savings over the lifetime uh, from 2010. So really big, big numbers um, of just not optimizing our breastfeeding outcomes. And you saw England was lower than the United States. Um, of just preventing some simple viral illnesses, gastroenteritis, um, ear infections, things of that nature. Um, and if you just double, not maximize the uh, breastfeeding rates, those savings would be pretty, pretty immense. Um, here's a journal I don't read. This is an economics journal um, that's outputted here. And uh, John Weimer is an economist who looked at um, uh, really a review and analysis of breastfeeding outcomes. Um, and that author put the target um, on a more global scale at $3.6 billion if we just bumped from the 64% in hospital and 29% at six months 
breastfeeding rates to the Surgeon General goals from 2010, which are 75 and 50 percent for those same outcomes. Um, that doesn't take into account the missed days of daycare or work or you know parental productivity that may be impacted, um, but really only the treatment of those childhood illnesses: otitis media, gastroenteritis, and NAC. Um, so. That's a big number. I mean, anytime there's a B in front of it, I tend to open my eyes and say, wow, that's, that's a lot of money. Um, and then just to put a different figure on it, 1997 was the last time I could find data for this, but WIC, the Women's Infants and Children's Nutrition Program here in the United States, the largest purchaser of formula in the United States spent almost $600 million on formula, and I promise you they're not paying what you and I would pay at Target for this, um, never mind the fancier grocery store in town. Um, almost $600 million just to purchase formula to be able to distribute families who are eligible for that program. So a huge and important benefit for folks who need access to supplemental nutrition, but it's not everything that families and babies need as far as the amount of formula that's given or the food allowance that's given to moms when they're breastfeeding. So it's a supplementary program and it still accounts for just a huge, huge amount. Um, and so the 6.5 million that the CDC grant is that we're working on, you know, 10% of what our government is spending just to buy powdered formula, right, is what they're spending on working on breastfeeding here. So if you think about realigning some of the finances there and what we might be able to do to improve breastfeeding outcomes, you could see some of those costs or economic benefits working out in the long run. Um, that would really ultimately save dollars for the healthcare system and improve health. And so the new quadruple aim or triple aim uh, before our, our own wellness was added to it, right? Um, this is something that can, that can help us reach that goal. All right, so how are we doing, right? At least in the United States, we can't cover the whole globe here because it's uh, even an hour and a half, that would be ambitious. But here in the United States, Let's look at what the CDC told us in 2014. Uh, so this is the United States. My 13-year-old is currently having to learn all of the state names and capitals, so he's very excited by this slide because he can point to all the different shapes and tell you which state it is and what their capital is. I'm not sure I can. Mm -hmm. uh, but there you all are down here in Louisiana. Um, my wife did graduate school at Tulane for a number of years, and so I spent a fair amount of time over there in the French Quarter. This is my first time to Shreveport. Um, but uh, there you are down um, in, uh, away from where the hurricane is coming up over there by Florida. And this is breastfeeding initiation, okay? So this is across the country, state by state, how many women during the birth hospitalization are giving breastfeeding a try? Any breastfeeding, not exclusive breastfeeding. And so if you get out to California and the Northwest uh, states, Washington and Oregon, there are a whole lot of women are starting breastfeeding and that's cultural and that's population based um, and that represents the geographic diversity of our country. Uh, when you get into the middle you get a lot more different kind of shadings. Uh, you get up to New England and the numbers are a little bit higher there. You get down to Florida and the numbers may be uh, a little bit different. North Carolina over there we're, we're hanging out about 77 percent and then down here in Louisiana, Louisiana, Mississippi, West Virginia and Kentucky have the, the lightest blue on this map. Um, <laughs> you're about 57%, okay? But what that number really tells me more than anything else is that most women want to try this, right? Most women have some amount of desire to breastfeed, at least, you know, almost two thirds, at least in your state. Um, and so this is a desirable outcome. This is something that folks at least want to give a shot at um, and want to try. And again, this is, this is before, this is uh, data from 2011. So this is certainly before Empower and the predecessor to Empower, um, and when very few hospitals around the country were, were pursuing baby-friendly, never mind designated. So this is something that women at least want to try. They have some curiosity or interest in it, or they've heard that it might be good for them or their baby. Um, but then you look at exclusivity at three months. So how many, what, what percentage of women are able to say, okay, well, I started in the hospital. I did a good job. I felt okay about it. Three months comes along. How am I doing? Um, and you see a similar pattern of, of shading in terms of how it looks across the states, but across the board, the numbers drop dramatically. Even California, where almost 100% of women at least initiate some amount of breastfeeding, just over 50% are still doing it uh, exclusively at three months. But down here, again, focusing on, on Louisiana, 
25% of moms are exclusively breastfeeding at three months of age right here in your state. Um, and so that's one in four. That's a fair number of moms who want to do this, not just for a little bit, but they're really committed to it because um, exclusivity at three months really predicts that that's someone who's going to see breastfeeding through until its natural conclusion um, when either mom, either mom or baby is no longer um, able to keep it up. Um, and so that's, you know, it's, it's a number that obviously has room to go up, but it tells me, again, that this is one in four patients that you're rounding on, um, potentially, again, lumping the state in, uh, may, maybe a little bit uh, of a bias that we're introducing, but one in four of them really have this goal of breastfeeding being a way that they um, offer nutrition to their babies. And then if we look at any breastfeeding at six months, the number's actually a little bit higher. So one in three are still doing some amount of breastfeeding all the way out at six months when you guys are doing your counseling down there in clinic about starting cereals and vegetable purees and <laughs> all that. Anybody, anybody expecting a call? Um, the bat phone, right? Um, so again, this is a desirable outcome. This is something that folks want to try at least, want to do, um, and have an interest in sustaining. And so as I've sort of navigated our own hospital through the baby-friendly designation process, and we're actually now in the redesignation process, so we're diving deep again on our own data back home about how we're doing practice-wise, I think of it as, so what can I do to not undermine that, right? How can I think about not stopping a mom who wants to breastfeed from achieving that goal, as opposed to how can I make more people breastfeed? That's not my agenda is to to push people to do something that they're not interested. I certainly want to educate them about it. Um, but from a simpler standpoint, what can I do to remove barriers um, as opposed to um, prod people in a direction they might not want to go? But those data really tell me that at least a decent chunk of the population wants to try this. So in Louisiana, um, I think we can still conclude that breastfeeding is a desired outcome with 57% of women initiating, 25% exclusively breastfeeding still at three months, and 30% and still breastfeeding some um, at 60 months. And so I'll just throw in here one little so sort of side note. Uh, this comes from one of the reports out of Best Fed Beginnings, which was the predecessor project to um, Empower, um, which took a cohort of hospitals through baby-friendly designation. But uh, one of the hospitals commented that they tried donor milk out, uh, donor human milk out, as part of their um, journey. Um, and the newborn special care unit in the last two years decided to provide donor milk. I'm not sure, obviously, the more studies that come out in the research about the incredible effect of colostrum for very small babies, uh, probably the motivation, I imagine. But the fact that we're taking baby friendly just brought more strength to that situation. It adds to the picture of what we're trying to do here with baby friendly hospital initiatives. So this is, this is like, we're doing this thing where we're thinking about one set of outcomes, but just about every resident in the room quietly said, neck, when we talked about donor milk or human milk uh, in terms of health benefits for preemies. And so start thinking about aligning those, um, aligning those goals of improving your ability to give human milk to the NICU baby, the high-risk infant, for neck prevention, and then think about how that might extend to some of the other practices of breastfeeding promotion that you could do. Um, in your hospital. One of the questions that came up on the tour this morning is, well, what about that mom who's, whose baby's admitted to the NICU? You know, are they going to get interviewed when we're, when we're getting our, our visit? Or are they going to be counted in our numbers? You know, you're, you're kind of drilling down to the data, right? But one of the greatest um, stories I've heard on, on this little trip uh, project over the past three years is a hospital that said, okay, well, let's focus on those NICU babies, about letting mom get colostrum to send with her baby to the NICU. So you all swoop in, you're, you're the resident team going into the, to the stork code and you're resuscitating that baby and doing all the things that you need to do and stabilizing them, getting them lined, getting their respiratory support or their surfactant delivered, all those important things that you do. And mom is like totally freaking out because her baby is really sick and this is routine for you. You're getting good at it, right? Um, but it's scary as anything for that mom. And so what this hospital did was they took that time with those moms to talk about expressing colostrum. They said, let's do this now, because this is something you can do for your baby. You can't help your baby right now. The team needs to do that. They know how that equipment works, and they know what your baby needs. But you can express colostrum, so when your baby's ready to feed, 
you can give it your milk, and here's what that might help. It might help prevent it from getting advertising enterocolitis. It might help with its gut flora development, those sorts of things. And they found just that little bit of language and process in the delivery room increased the rates of their moms expressing milk among the NICU population by double. They were getting colostrum, they were bringing it to the babies, and, and those moms were continuing to bump, pump and provide human milk for their babies. So, like, this isn't just about the numbers and 80% and, you know, 30% and, and, you know, all these guidelines and criteria that are important. This is about thinking about how y'all are approaching the different challenges that you're facing here and, you know, what could you tweak or do a little bit differently that might help not just the baby-friendly hospital outcome but the clinical outcome of your patients. So I thought that captured that kind of nicely. Um, and so what about the baby-friendly hospital initiative um, and some of the quality improvement tools that your team has been learning and using? Uh, certainly walking around the units this morning, I see graphs of data hanging on the walls and I see metrics and measures and I see processes that have been changed and I see <coughs> little evidence of quality improvement going on at the, at the unit level. Um, and so what are some of those tools and how can we use them to help um, support breastfeeding moms? Um, so there's lots of things that we've been doing over the past couple of decades. Ban the Bags was one of the first outcomes. How, how many folks are kind of doing this long enough that they remember Ban the Bags? That goes back, that goes back a little while. So years ago, it used to be just routine that you get a nice canvas bag every time you had a baby, provided by one of the formula companies with lots of pretty graphics and labeling on it, and it would be filled with things to help you take care of your new baby, including maybe some bibs or maybe some onesies or some diapers and, of course, some formula. Um, and that was just routine. You get a baby, you get a bag. And they were provided free by the companies uh, for us to pass along and tacitly market their product. Um, and endorse it almost by giving away those bags. And starting, what, 20 years ago now, banning those bags became a real push. Um, and it's a step in the right direction of helping us kind of not market on behalf of the formula companies. Um, and so different folks have filled that in with different, you know, different placeholders. Some, some hospitals give out other gifts that aren't, you know, marketing anything in particular. Some have found that they don't really need to give anything in particular out. Uh, but that's a big step. Community outreach is key, so partnering with your WIC organizations, your practices uh, that you're either getting your OB referrals from or you're sending your babies out to after, after discharge. Baby Friendly USA has obviously played a big role. Um, Baby Friendly USA is basically the U.S. vector for implementation and designation around the World Health Organization 10 Steps to Successful Breastfeeding. So the WHO says around the world these are the 10 things that everybody should be doing in a birth hospital and in a birthing environment um, to support best outcomes related to breastfeeding. Baby Friendly USA says good job you're doing all those 10 things and oh by the way you're not accepting freebies from the formula company. That's the other piece of baby friendly designation that makes up that recognition. We obviously need to be educated I'm curious for the medical students in the room. You're on pediatrics now, so maybe you've heard about it, but did you get like a lecture in the first two years about breastfeeding? Oh my God, that's awesome. That's, do you, like, did you learn something and you remember it? What, what was the take home message? Like pray? All I remember from medical school about learning about breastfeeding is secretory IgE. That was the only take home message that I left medical school with. with Secretary IGA. IGA, I don't even remember it anymore. Um, so that's great. So I, I had almost no exposure graduating in 2000 to, um, to breastfeeding as a medical student. And I had very little as a resident. It was sort of something that some people did, but I certainly didn't get a lecture on it. I didn't get to sort of help or learn about it or learn from a lactation consultant or anything like that during residence. So for the residents outside, you know, are you guys getting exposed to breastfeeding? You have lectures. I'm seeing some. So yep. nods, yep. Uh, and then you have a nursery rotation, you have a NICU rotation, you feel like you're getting getting some touch on there. How often is the topic in the NICU does it come up with? They all got the answer right about next. So. <laughs> right, <laughs> yeah. at least once during the rotation. During the rotation, that's great. I mean, that's a huge uh, step um, from, from even 10 or 15 years ago. I didn't really learn about breastfeeding until we had a kid. And along those lines, you know, both nationally and internationally, there are NICUs don't have zero. 
yeah. you know, including your uh, hour, yeah. have a very low the formula infraction, yeah. none, yeah. Uh, low the neck and uh, mass general uh, yeah. passenger. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's really been shown around the country to be a, a profoundly uh, um, important intervention. But I think for the large part in nursing and medical school, it was not something that those of us who have been out here for 10, 15, 20 years or more really learned about back then. And so we've had to educate ourselves either through our own children <laughs> um, or through you know projects such as this one or others. Um, at the state level, there's five star or other recognition programs, and your hospital has participated and I think achieved the top level of the state um, or close to it. Yes, yeah. Um, the Louisiana Breastfeeding Coalition uh, looks like a pretty active uh, group. And then, obviously, I think the last piece that we've really been trying to push on this Empower project is using data, right? Using quality improvement science, using practice change in a thoughtful way to think about ways that you can improve outcome. That example of having a mom express whose baby is definitely going to the NICU is a way that you can change the process so that the outcome um, is, improved. is improved. So here's the, the summary slide on baby friendly, um, the designating entity for the United States on saying, good job, you guys here at um, University Health Shreveport. Yeah. <laughs> You changed your name on us part way through, um, are compliant with the 10 steps. Your policies and your practices and your community outreach are in line with what the goals are. And you're buying your own formula. You're not marketing on behalf of whoever it is that's making formula these days. Nestle, Mead Johnson, Abbott, a couple of them. Um, so what is Baby Friendly Hospital Initiative? And this is kind of the, the what it isn't slide more than the what it is, but it's really a global program. It's backed by the World Health Organization. It's been around since 1991, um, from the originating in UNICEF. Uh, it's really safe feeding practices for all babies, whether or not they're breastfeeding. And so one of the biggest learning points the team was telling me about this morning, it's like, you're actually teaching moms how to formula feed when that's their choice, how to safely mix it so they're not readmitted to the pediatric ward at four days of life with a sodium of 152 or whatever, right? Um, how to think about what water they might use uh, to, to mix it. Is their water supply safe? Do they need to boil it? Do they not need to boil it? Do they use fluoridated water? Do they use non fluoridated water? <laughs> like all those questions about how to do that in the optimal way um, are addressed for the women who are formula feeding at discharge. You get a recognition um, that you're really following evidence based care um, and that you're in compliance again with that international code. Uh, against the marketing of breast milk substitutes. And so the analogy I've often made there, and I went through your clinic this morning, um, it's a really cool design where you have that ability to see kids along the lifespan for wellness, for disease management, and for illness so that they're not going to the emergency room with coughs and colds or bronchiolitis or whatever. You can manage a huge amount of stuff. You have x-ray lab, all that stuff. Um, if you all gave out Dr. Pepper at the two-year well child checks, right, we would see an epidemic of Dr. Pepper consumption among toddlers, right? If you just had a little baggie of Dr. Pepper that went out with them after that two or that five-year-old well child check, boy, we'd have a lot of tooth decay and some obesity issues, right? Some diabetes concerns. But that, that's kind of what the marketing, uh, the international code is to, to infant formula. Let's not put a substitute in everybody's hand as an endorsement of that when they're walking in the door, never mind when they're walking out the door, but let's instead focusing on helping them achieve their goals. And if that goal is exclusive breastfeeding, then helping them do that successfully rather than sending them out with the alternative. Um, so even if you counseled your patients, Dr. Pepper is not really the best thing for your baby, but here's some just in case he's picky and doesn't want anything else with his supper tonight. Like it's just, it, it doesn't make any sense. And, and it took me a while to come around to that logic with formula, having gotten ba bags with my boys when they were born, and having had cases of formula show up on my doorstep within two days of their, or two weeks anyway, of their due dates, every time, even though we moved in the middle of that. <laughs> um, like, it's like they know, right? They know my wife was buying maternity clothes seven months earlier, and that box shows up. It's, it's sort of, it's almost a little bit scary. So what are the 10 steps? This is not a slide that you're meant to read. It's here for reference if anybody's looking back at these. Um, in the future, and they're certainly easier to Google than anything else. Um, but they really um, are pretty concise. Um, there's a lot of 
extra language behind them in the in the WHO guidelines and the baby friendly materials. But that's that's the ten steps that the World Health Organization agreed upon um, way back when. Um, and I think in large part they've really stood the test of time. So the way that I've taken to approaching them as a medical as a medical director, as a pediatrician, as a nursery doctor, um, is to try to break them down a little bit and understand what the heck they're about and what they mean. And in doing that, what I came up with as a framework is really steps one to three are about policy, about procedure, about education and training, including in the prenatal period. So OB in the back or family medicine? OB. OB. <laughs> Excellent. Oh, and again. Uh, so this really begins at the beginning. And in fact, I think it begins before then. I think it begins back like in middle school, right? This should be part of health curricula. Uh, way before people are even thinking about or at risk for pregnancy, um, that it just kind of get normalized into into health curricula. But at least in the prenatal period, starting to paint that unbiased and supportive message towards breastfeeding, as opposed to the the way that I sort of did it as as a resident. And so, how are you feeding breast or bottle? Like it's a little bit counter counterproductive if you if you do that. You know, it's, what do you want for your with, with dinner? You know, you want milk or Dr Pepper? <laughs> Dr. Pepper, if it's a choice. Um, but steps one to three are policy, education, training. Um, and that, that's nitty gritty. It's important. And you do it, and you get it done. But steps four through nine are about process. They're about evidence-based practices that support initiation and continuation of exclusive breastfeeding. And specifically, things that you do here in the hospital. So you guys have 12 or 15 babies up there in the nursery on a given day, it sounds like, and they churn through pretty fast. So yesterday's babies are not today's babies. Um, you might get them for two days, but rarely longer than that. And so you have 10 to 15 new families every day who are impacted by these processes and these practices. And so if you can put those systems in place, so it's not dependent on the post-call resident to remember to write the order correctly, but it's just built into the, the pathway that those babies get onto. Um, that our practices are supporting this outcome, then we're going to be more successful than if each of us is relied upon individually to know every detail. Um, that allows us to think about the outliers if those fundamental pieces are in place. And then step 10 is really a unique step in that it's really about the community extension of this and what happens after they leave the hospital. It loops back to the OBs, but when do you guys see moms back postpartum? Six weeks, yeah. So six weeks, I, I mean, I can tell you at the one or two month visit in the office, I'd love to see what your guys' experience is. I mean, how often is it, oh yeah, they left the hospital, they were breastfeeding some, but the one month visit, it's all Enfamil, or they're asking for a WIC prescription for the other brand because the hospital had, you know, like <laughs> you guys had that um, experience. So how do we fill in that gap from the six week OB visit, which is really like, you're not even putting out the fire at that point. If they're struggling with breastfeeding at six weeks, it's probably <coughs> flaming out, if not gone. And so what do we do at 48 hours, at one week, at two weeks? How do we get moms who came from far away to have their baby here because they're high risk, plugged into something closer to home that can be supportive of them? And so really investigating, getting out, doing a scavenger hunt in your community for ways that you can find support uh, for moms and babies. So here's the steps one to three. We ban the bags. We don't let the marketers in. Mar uh, what, what was his name? Malcolm. Malcolm from the formula company can't come and give, give us lunch anymore. Um, and then as a hospital or a healthcare system, you purchase your own formula. Um, some of the materials that Empower has supplied to your, your hospital and your team are designed across the lifespan of prenatal hospital education and pediatric office education. So there's consistency in the sort of messaging and language that's used. And so that when the OB talks about what are your choices for feeding, and then they come into labor and delivery, and they talk to the hospital staff, and then the pediatrician comes in, and you guys make your rounds, that that language is all consistent in terms of being supportive and not, um, not judgmental about their choice one way or the other, but, but giving them the options to say, hey, I want to learn more about breastfeeding. Can you help me? Uh, if you haven't read it, uh, 2011 in the Breastfeeding Medicine Journal, which is put out by the Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine, uh, Todd Wolin, who's a pediatrician uh, in, I think you're right, yeah, P Pennsylvania for sure, um, penned an article called Breastfeeding So Easy and Even a Doctor Can Do It. This is, again, probably from an era when you weren't hearing about it during med school or even residency. 
um, but it just it does it does a really nice job of painting a picture of how you can uh, use simple language with families and and see the the support of breastfeeding as bearing the same importance as immunizations, as developmental surveillance, as um, you know early detection of childhood diseases, all those things that are fundamental to practice as a pediatrician um, as they relate to early breastfeeding support and promotion. Um, and then you guys do have a state breastfeeding coalition. Uh, that can be another resource for uh, education um, and community support. So, so there definitely are step one to three resources out there that I think are relatively accessible um, and geared towards uh, people at each, each part of the healthcare machine. Uh, so steps four through nine, right? Um, without getting into the nitty gritty of the wording of these steps, I really think about these steps in two big lumps. One is the golden hour. How many people have heard of the golden hour? Excellent. And it's not the golden hour about antibiotics coming into the ER with a central line. Not that golden hour. Okay. We're, the, we're on the breastfeeding golden hour, right? So what happens in the golden hour? This is a healthy, stable mom-baby dyad. This is not a 28-weeker or even a 34-weeker who's grunting and retracting and you know looks a little gray still. <laughs> this is not a baby with low APGAR scores or <coughs> genital anomalies that's requiring the NICU team to be at the bedside immediately. This is a healthy, stable dyad. But they're together until that first feeding, typically about an hour, sometimes 90 minutes. They're skin to skin. That's ventral to ventral. Mom's chest, woo! Mom's chest and baby's chest. Up here, head to the side, sniffing position. It's not dump the baby up there. And um, I know in my hospital, moms seem to be more bigger and bigger. Um, and so it, you, ha you have to be careful about this um, in, in the current obesity epidemic, for sure. But it's, skin to skin is not plopping the baby and running away. Skin to skin is an evidence-based practice with a very particular way of doing it that is safe. Um, and there's not safe ways to do it as well. It's the stable dyad. It's putting them in that position until they crawl up. There's a great video um, on YouTube that you can find easily of the baby doing the crawl, um, where it finds its way, latches on all by itself. You don't need a nurse helping it. You don't need a lactation consultant helping it. You don't need a dad or a grandmother helping it. It just finds its way and latches on. And that first latch being successful is one of the best predictors of long-term breastfeeding success in moms and babies. Um, Extending the golden hour to rooming in, so mom and baby should be together and not separate so they can learn each other's cues, so that they can get to know each other, that mom can feel more comfortable caring for baby. Obviously, if she's magged out and got a big whop of opiates before her emergency C-section, not the right time to say, oh my god, we got to be rooming in right now. Make the situation safe, and then when that mom wakes up from her little traumatic delivery, then you focus on these practices. Q-based feeding is one of the hardest parts of this, um, but this is feeding when baby's hungry, not when your Apple Watch beeps at you and says you need to put that baby to rest. Um, this is really teaching moms to recognize early cues of hunger, that rooting that we learn about as a reflex, uh, sticking the tongue out, turning the head to one side, not waiting until they're crying and screaming, which if you think about the nursery model, right? Oh, all the babies are lined up and they're nice and quiet and as soon as they start crying we roll them out to mom to feed. That really sets, sets you up for failure because the baby's past its willingness to feed, it's now desperate. Um, and so if you can teach those skills to mom, they feel, wait for it, empowered going home um, to be more confident in taking care of that baby and recognizing if it's cueing correctly, if it's hungry, um, if it's satisfied after a feeding because they've had practice and they've built that skill set uh, with more time uh, with their baby. And then the last piece, and this is really in my mind again, to promote cue-based feeding, you want to avoid pacifiers in the first little bit. Now, the most common question I get with this is, but the AAP recommends pacifiers, right? Everybody knows that. But they recommend it after the successful establishment of breastfeeding. So there is some literature that pacifier use is associated with a lower risk of SIDS. Apparently ceiling fans are also. Uh, obviously back to sleep alone in your crib, no extra stuff in there. Um, but go ahead and introduce that pacifier at a week of age or something like that. Um, go ahead and use a pacifier if you have a baby with NAS who's sucking as a matter of reflex as they're trying to flush those opiates out of their system. 
go ahead and use a pacifier if a glove finger is not working during a circumcision. But don't put a pacifier in every bassinet and treat it as a normal thing in the baby's first two days of life because they don't need a pacifier in the first two days of life. They need to be at the breast and trying to figure out if mom's going to make enough milk for them because if they suckle at the breast frequently, mom will make enough milk for them. Um, the second half of the step four to nine bundle, these practices are milk expression. Um, and so these are um, really important skills that you, you and I, the docs in the room, we may not learn how to do this, although in my experience, our residents are often asking if they can go with lactation now and learn about hand expression or how to do a latch because they know they're going to be out in office practice in another year and they're going to have a mom and baby come in who can't latch. And if they have that skill set, they'll feel better maybe being able to intervene. Um, we also have a lactation consultant trained resident in our cohort right now, and so she's really champion in this cause um, at UNC anyway. But, um, you know, milk expression for separation, the baby who's born and has to go to the NICU, um, the mom is going to be going back to work and needs to learn how to do that. Um, or the indicated supplement. Uh, we've had a lot of success in our institution with expressing colostrum for babies at risk for hypoglycemia. Um, and so you get that baby who's an infant of a diabetic mother, maybe 4.1 kilos on the big side. You get that first blood sugar when, the, when they're you know, 90 minutes old and it's 28. You get that baby some milk, right? Um, lo and behold, if you express colostrum and feed to the baby, the, the sugar goes up. I, we, we almost didn't believe it the first time we, we documented that, we measured it. It's like, hey, how about that? Colostrum, fix the blood sugar issue. Um, and we're actually doing a project right now on skin to skin uh, to help stabilize blood sugar in those hypo, hypoglycemic infants. Um, and it's so far looking pretty promising. But milk expression, finding a way to get uh, alternate um, milk in the case of separation or supplementation is a skill that mom doesn't just use day one, day two postpartum. She uses it on down the road. Um, she uses it when she's unexpectedly separated from her two-week-old because she's back at the OBs because her incision is doing something funny. Um, or she's back to work. Um, so that's a skill that, again, empowers moms um, to think about ways that they can continue um, breastfeeding uh, despite separation. Uh, so what are some tools that we can use? This is the most fundamental one. How many folks have learned what a PDSA cycle is? Do you all have a quality... <laughs> These guys are... Yes! <laughs> do, do you all have a quality improvement requirement during residency? How does that work in here at LSU? You're doing them in, in continuity clinic? Okay. So quality improvement is becoming one of the key pillars of, of doctoring and working in healthcare. Is not just looking at how we do things, but how can we do things better? And how can we change the way we're doing things if we've discovered that there's a better way? So the PDSA, or the Plan, Do, Study, Act model comes out of the sort of industrial realm. Um, but it translates reasonably well to healthcare in that it's a little bit of a twist on our traditional scientific training of hypothesis-driven research. It's just the flipped classroom kind of version of that where you make a plan, right? What might happen if we try this? Let's try it, right? You do it, but you don't do it like across the entire hospital on a Tuesday that everything is all of a sudden different. You do it for this baby or this patient who's checking into clinic or this time that you're doing a central line placement or, or whatever it is that you're trying to improve. Um, and then you study the outcome on that small scale. And then you say, well, that didn't work. Chuck that idea. Um, or, hey, that worked really well. Let's, let's try that for the next baby who comes in. Or, gosh, if we tweak that just a little bit, it would work just as well, but we'd do it faster. Um, and so the line would be in faster, and the wound infection or the line infection might be less likely down the road because the mucking around time was shorter. Um, and then you do it again, right? So you learn from those conclusions, and you plan your next one. And so these can be done on a daily basis, on a shiftly basis, on a weekly basis. As your projects evolve, they can be done on a monthly basis. Once you've done enough of these, the PDSA will stand for please don't start another. And you'll hear from your continuity <laughs> clinic director, please don't start another. 
<laughs> don't tell me we're doing more cycles today in clinic. But if you get to that point, it means you've done enough QI and you've actually learned these skills and you'll find yourself just thinking in a way of continuous improvement. Um, but test, measure, and adapt. Um, and this can be just a really powerful learning tool, but um, also a really powerful improvement tool because it, le it, le it lets you do things at small scale so that you're not having to change dogma in an overnight kind of way. You can really, you can ease into a new practice and get comfortable with it over time. Um, step 10, um, ooh, those got out of order somehow. Sorry. Uh, step 10 is about community and outreach. So your women's, infants, children's uh, supplemental nutrition program. You guys have a lactation clinic. It's relatively new. It is booming with activity and business. I've heard that the volume has been doubling like on a month over month basis since it started in June. Do I have that right? Um, it's embedded in your clinic, which is great, and um, also in the OB clinic. And so that's something that you now have, again, across the continuum. Um, and so what can you be doing in your pediatric offices beyond that? How about helping the pediatric offices that aren't part of your system where your patients may go? How about your family medicine group? Are they on board with this, or is there this sort of we do it this way and they do it that way kind of mentality. Um, how about the OB follow-up? Is there room for a different model of come back in six weeks of OB care in this era of value-based outcomes, you know, uh, measurement that we're looking at in the future? Um, is there, you know, a care management or a visiting nurse uh, program that might be able to hit both of these gaps and, and help all of us, whether we're pediatrician, family doc, or OB? What, we, what about moms going back to work? I, I've been amazed. Like, the, I, don't want, I don't even want to go to politics, but like it's, it's come up in the election that like paid family leave is an important thing. Um, so like, can we as pediatricians advocate that discussion to not be the third topic, but be the first one? Can we support not only moms, but dads in the back to work transition so that um, we can help them um, as they ease back into, into that realm? Um, and then what's the community doing, right? Um, I was on an itty bitty plane from Atlanta here into Shreveport last <laughs> night. I was in the third row and I felt like I was towards the back of the plane. <laughs> um, and there was a young couple next to me, or, or a row back, and the mom was just kind of nursing her baby as they tried to navigate the, you know, sitting on the tarmac and waiting for the takeoff and then the ear pressure change thing. And, Nobody made a fuss over it. It was great. I think the steward even came by and like gave them a little bit of extra water or something to help help them out. Like we need that level of community support so that wherever you are, if you have a mom uh, and a baby breastfeeding, um, we're being supportive of that instead of um, it's icky or judgmental or staring or or not just creating space to do it. In fact, in Atlanta, one of the terminals had a little mom baby pod. This little closet size thing for a mom and a baby to go into so that she could pump or she could breastfeed her baby. Simple things like that actually send a huge message about change. The other terminal in Atlanta had a smoking section. I think that, that's, a, that's a step in the right direction. Um, so if that's, a sign of, if that's not a sign of progress, I don't know what it is. But, but as you guys walk through your community here, you know, I, I don't know Shreveport, except that their casinos are on riverboats. <laughs> not in the buildings. They told me that on the way in last night. Um, but uh, you know your community. You know what's out there in terms of what your mom's struggles are. And if you don't, you can ask them, right? You can say, hey, why is it hard for you to, to do that? Oh, well, you know, and, then, and that, that might be the beginning of an advocacy project or some education or something else to do. So kind of the take home message here is, you know, can we do better? I think the answer is yes, but change is hard. It takes work. It takes teamwork, um, and you guys have a team on the hospital side over here uh, in nursing and lactation and administration who are incredibly supportive um, and working hard towards this change. Um, and so getting that so that it's unified and, and moving in the same direction is, is difficult. There's no question about it. And then as you crest that uh, wave and, and look on the horizon, what are you going to do to sustain this? Um, and so this is, I think, the UN, uh, which just got elected a new, um, not surgeon, just secretary general <laughs> uh, from Portugal. Yes. 
um, asking who wants change, and everybody's hand is up. Like, we all want change, right? But who wants to change? Me. I don't, I'm, I'm fine. <laughs> I do things just right. I don't, he's got to change. She's got to change. It's the hospital's fault. It's the patients. They don't want to breastfeed. No, we all have to change um, if we want to achieve it sort of on the global scale. And so just to sort of nail that home, this is you guys. Um, Monica shared this with me like last week, this week. Um, so this is you all. It goes back to December 2013. So before Empower, um, work was beginning here locally on thinking about baby-friendly designation and what you're doing about it. And then it goes out to September of 2016. So this is like up to the minute data. Uh, PCO5 is the Joint Commission's measure on exclusive breastfeeding. That's just a raw number. Every baby born, whether they go to the NICU or the nursery or wherever, what's your percentage? And it's nudging up slightly. Um, and I think that, that tells you where you all are, which is a tough place to start, which is that breastfeeding is not the norm and exclusive breastfeeding is even uh, lower. Sorry, that's... Um, Purple is then exclusive amongst your nursery babies, right? So in your nursery, you are moving the needle, right? You are getting up above your state um, average there. And then the processes that you're working on, you know, what are mom's intentions? About 50%. That's what we saw in the state data. Um, are they initiating at their intention rate? Well, they are now, better than they used to. And then skin to skin, one of those practice changes in the four to seven steps that we talked about, or the four to nine steps, Skin to skin is just that early practice. Um, that has been taking off. And I can tell you that with that taking off, you're going to see the breastfeeding numbers follow because breastfeeding is a side effect of skin to skin. When the baby's <laughs> at the table, it's more likely to eat. Um, and you're seeing the skin to skin really move as these practices have changed. So you guys are like in the momentum phase of this project now. And I think you're going to see the numbers really come. So the, the answer to that is absolutely yes, and you are. Um, and I think it's only going to continue from what I've heard from the team um, this morning. So I guess I'll end on this one rather than yours. Um, so we started our journey in 2011. My daughter there is much older than that now, was born in 2010. But she was one of the babies who benefited from our hospital going through baby friendly designation. My wife certainly wanted to breastfeed her, um, and we had less systematic barriers to her doing that um, by the time Catherine was born. And so we had uh, 3,600 deliveries in 2011, 3,200 of them got human milk, 2440 exclusively. Um, so at the end of our journey, as we were looking to the horizon of um, designation, we had a 90% initiation rate and almost 70% exclusive human milk feeding. Um, and so pretty impactful when you think about the numbers. And you all have 2,000 plus deliveries here, so even if you double your rate, um, you're going to have a massive impact in terms of numbers um, and families that are impacted by this. Um, so that's the, the personal side of it for me and some of where I come from with this. Um, so breastfeeding is a public health issue. It's really important. The Surgeon General's behind it. The World Health Organizations and accrediting bodies and expert groups around the country are all supportive of it. Um, how we practice, the language that we use, the systems that we have in place, the communication that works well or doesn't between our teams really can improve outcomes. And when a process can improve an outcome, that's when you're doing like healthcare 3.0. That's when you're really leveraging all this technology and EHRs and you know decision support and all these tools that have come out over the last decade and kind of taken over, but you're actually using those things to let you still sit down with the patient and improve their outcome. Um, and so really being thoughtful and iterative about your approach to practice change um, is an important way to help you achieve your goals. Because if you just say, gosh, we can't do it, you know, our, our patients don't breastfeed, or we can't really budget for formula purchasing in our hospital, no, we can't do it. But if you take off small chunks at a time and work on practice change slowly, you really can get there. Um, our nursery was not in that shape in 2008 when I moved it, uh, to Chapel Hill. And uh, over many long, hard battles and changes and processes and, and work uh, by a lot of people, you know, you, you can get there. And I think what I've seen, at least this morning from your team, is that you are moving in that direction in a really powerful way. So I've intentionally left a fair amount of time for discussion and questions. And so I would love to hear from you all about um, 
Any questions that have come up or challenges that you're facing here? Yeah. Uh, that was an excellent overview. One comment and a couple of questions. The comment is, you know, you talked about NEC in the NICU, but the new data that's come out in the last five years, uh, Dr. Walker from, uh, he's a faculty professor at Harvard as well as London, he showed some elegant data on these preemies by doing echocardiograph in clinical, that incidence of heart disease, metabolic syndrome is markedly decreased. Uh, in, in long, you're talking about in long-term follow-up? Long-term, he's got into a long term yeah, yeah. because you know, he's, been, he's a big yeah. advocate of yeah. breastfeeding and preemies. Early, and early, early adopter. Yeah. yeah, he was at the University of London and at, at Harvard for a long time. But anyway, the questions are, they presented excellent data and you talked about public health which is your number one confusion message. But it's a cultural issue. Yeah. As I've shared with Dana and all these gals here yeah. who do a wonderful work here. When I go to other countries, as I told yeah. you, in Africa, and yeah. it's a cultural thing. It's not, a, it's not an issue. Even if I go to the NICU step down unit, yeah. every mother within a few feet are breastfeeding their yeah. babies, they've got them covered. Yeah. So have we all looked at breakdown of population? in terms of racial barriers, in terms of cultural barriers, rural versus urban, because to me that's what is a challenge because there is a generational thing. The mother and the grandmother is breastfed, so yep. they are breastfeeding these babies. Yep. Or it's a first and generation immigrant and this is a new customers. resource they have. So did everyone hear the question? Thank you. You're welcome. Did everyone hear the question? Was that clear? So longer term health outcomes data in preemies um, with metabolic disease and heart disease from long term follow up of human milk in the preemie, the health outcomes are even better, right? So clearly this is something that has mounting evidence to support it. But the question is how do you overcome the cultural barriers? You know, in the developing world, your alternative to breastfeeding is that your baby dies. <laughs> you know, that nobody is sending formula to the hut or the village that many of these women are delivering in. So if they're not breastfeeding their baby, they better have a family member or someone else in that community who's willing to nurse their baby on, on their behalf. Well, as you know, Nestle put and, it in India and Africa, they were banned. Mm -hmm. they right, yeah. The and they that's that. Because they were giving yeah. three, four, four yeah. Yeah. and the mothers were diluting it. Yep. And, and, that, couldn't afford it. and that's the so international, that's the, right. code, that's that's the, the yeah. international code preventing marketing. So. You know, and, until you're in such a resource, a relatively rich resource, resource rich place, um, it's a slippery slope. But you all have seen babies admitted with, with failure to thrive because formula is being diluted, because WIC does not supply the full month's need. Um, you've seen babies who is just mixed improperly because of instructions and they're hypernatremic or having a seizure. Um, and so, I mean, to me, it's really getting fundamentally back to, I think they've got something right in the developing world, which is that human milk is the best thing for human babies. And so getting that marketing and that free formula out of our hospitals, which has been effective in the international communities, but the lobby here is, is bigger. It's the, you know, it's the analogy of the, the cigarette companies spend more on advertising by January 4th than the federal government spends on anti-smoking cessation campaigns. And I think it's the same with formula companies. They spend more on marketing in a week than the CDC spends in three years on promoting breastfeeding. So we're fighting an uphill battle against that um, that's, that's been pressing since the, since the 1950s when commercial formula production kind of ramped up. And you know my, my colleagues who are a generation ahead of me like to share that their mothers weren't sent home with a formula bag. They were sent home with a recipe for how to mix substitute milk for their baby in case they ran into trouble. And they had to boil water and measure out. Can you imagine trying to teach your patients how to do this with low literacy or a language barrier? It's impossible. Um, and, and so as that commercialization came in and these forces towards, um, you know, the alternative were so My dramatic. Second. I think we're, we're it, it's a huge problem. Um, My second question is also related. I'm relating developing countries to the developed nation here. You go to, again, you go to India, Africa, you will see always in the television there's an advertisement mm -hmm. of mothers being asked the advantage of breastfeeding, that you should do that, yeah. all healthy yeah. uh, lifestyle. Is the CDC planning to get involved? I've asked Murthy about this. Murthy, as you know, is a current surgeon general. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so, 
uh, perhaps you are closer to them and uh, maybe yeah so maybe that is very effective yeah so there's definitely public health messaging going on Murthy was, this is one of those things that makes me really feel old. He was two years behind me in med school. He's the Surgeon General. <laughs> <laughs> um, keeps, you, keeps you humble. Um, so they're definitely doing uh, national campaigns, but to put it on the billboards across the interstates, across our gigantic country, or the airwaves, um, you know, that's, that's a big expense. And so there is certainly some of that. And at the community level, there's a lot of messaging and marketing that's being done. Um, but I think the CDC has decided that investing in kind of boots on the ground support and really focusing on us as the people who have moms and babies as our captive audience is money better spent than, you know, giving it to the advertising firm to come up with a flashy ad and paying, you know, paying towards that. I, is that right? I don't, I don't know. But um, I think there's got to be a mix of messaging. and. Um, I've seen a lot on social media in both directions, and so I think our, our role as professionals is maybe to be in that conversation and dispelling the myths and promoting the, um, the positive messages. Um, stuff. Question. The last yeah. question I'm going to ask, I was telling Diana yesterday that the paper that came out of Harvard, as you know, mm -hmm. where the pediatrician was following, our population is different. Many of them are obese, as you suggested. We are encouraging these mothers to put the baby on the breast, feed them every hour or two. Mm -hmm. And the incidence of SIDS in Massachusetts has increased at the same time uh, as the breastfeeding, uh, breastfeeding is being promoted. Of course, there was no scientific data other than the data from the, uh, from the public health department. They presented that. And he posed that as a question. That when obese mothers are falling asleep, yeah. they're tired. They've got medications, some of them are drug withdrawal. Yeah. So are we creating a new problem or how are we monitoring? That's the question. That's part of our education. Yeah. Right. Right. That's so, really and so, is yeah. the mother has to be awake and alert. Yeah. She's Correct. Tired. That's, yeah. that's the point he's making. Yeah. Shouldn't keep yes. the baby in the this bed. This is not, yeah. yeah. Plop the baby on and be skin to skin until kindergarten. This is not the message. This is about really safe sleep. And so, so our hospital, interestingly enough, just last year went and got a state level safe sleep certification for exactly the reason that you bring up is, hold on a second here, are we sending too strong a message of skin to skin um, that the moms are doing it and coming to like it? And then we've sent a message alone back crib, don't co-sleep. And so they go to the couch and they're skin to skin and they fall over. And so in my mind, that's not SIDS as much as it is accidental suffocation. And that gets into the semantics of labeling. But um, I think we really do need to be re-upping our game. And there were two articles recently that came out, companion pieces in JAMA, as well as an AAP policy statement on safe sleep, um, where really doubling down on our efforts to, to not just tell people how to do it, but to really model it in the hospital so that on those hourly roundings when the nurses are going in and checking on families, if mom's just getting to that drowsy stage with her baby skin to skin saying, oh, you look like you're ready to rest and your baby's sleeping. Let me put her over here alone on her back in her crib. Um, and, and she'll be able to sleep comfortably and you'll rest better, not worried that you're going to drop her. Um, and using that language and not setting up the bed so the baby gets entrapped um, and those sorts of things so that we're, again, using it as an educational opportunity and I still walk into rounds, and the Hispanic families in our nursery have this habit. I don't know where it comes from, but they take the mom's bed pillow, like the big adult pillow. They stuff it into that plastic bassinet. They cover it with this beautiful knit blanket that a grandmother or someone sent them. And they set the baby on top of it. And the baby at that point is above the side rail of the bassinet. And I just about faint every time I walk into one of these rooms. And I pick the baby up and say, oh, that's beautiful. But let me show you how to set this bed up. Um, so you're constantly reinforcing those, those safe practices. Um, and I think it does need to become part of your education, especially with the nursing staff who are in there every hour, about reinforcing those messages about safe sleep so that we don't lose the forest for the trees. And, and like with our pain assessment, you know, find ourselves prescribing too many opiates. And, Dealing, dealing with that. So good questions. How about others? Any? Yeah. Um, 
My question is regarding pediatric residents. Um, I believe a lot of prenatal counseling really helps um, if parents actually decide if they want to breastfeed and actually keep it up. If a woman is not mentally prepared, it's really hard to talk to her in labor and delivery and when she has the baby. And I know at four hours of life. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I mean, they're so exhausted, they don't want to hear about it at that point. So what role can pediatric residents play like in the prenatal visit? Like, Would you recommend, for example, incorporating into the pediatric education, maybe like an elective such that we can maybe maybe round with a lactation consultant or see these women and kind of counsel them and reinforce and do you have anything for your <laughs> yes, Have you met Kathy yeah. yet? Yeah. <laughs> I'm talking about yeah. before the baby comes. Yeah, yeah. 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 I understand. So, did everyone hear the question? And if you have anything in your program for, you know, like a breastfeeding elective or something, because yeah. I've had like emails from other pediatric residents ac across the country trying to establish kind of like a breastfeeding elective, yeah. such that residents can have like two weeks where they can, you know, I just don't know. Just learn about it. So did everyone hear the question? It's a, it's a great question and it gets to, as pediatricians, we're, we're like the goalie. You know, we're the last line of defense in trying to help a mom and a baby breastfeed. And the OB, our OB colleagues in family medicine and prenatal clinics have months to really think about promoting this education and supporting supporting moms. So I think consistency in language. And so instead of, so breast or bottle mom, more how are you planning to feed your baby, right? And we'll support you feeding your baby. Oh, that's a great question. You know, when you see the pediatrician, you want to make sure you ask them about that. So using consistent language is one thing that's really important. Um, using the same resources, so the LACT-MED database from the National Library of Medicine, ToxNet, or uh, Thomas Hale's book about medications in mother's milk, right? Make sure your OB folks are using the same references to counsel the mom who's on a medication that's safe in pregnancy, but there might be questions about whether it's safe in lactation. Um, a common consult that we get um, in our hospital is you have a mom who's diagnosed, say, with breast cancer during her pregnancy and then has to deliver her baby and start chemo. Like, what do you do there? Or a mom needs a CAT scan, or on and on and on. So there's definitely areas where that communication and collaboration is really key. But to the education question, so we do have a informal lactation elective that we're building that OB residents, family medicine residents, and pediatric medicine uh, residents have all taken advantage of. And then I also offer a newborn elective, because our interns get newborn in their first year, and then they never get it again. They get a lot of NICU, but they don't get newborn again. And the ones who are going out into community practice, the ones who are becoming hospitalists, and they're going to go to deliveries and like run the newborn service in their hospital when they're at a residency, they come back as third years. Um, and we do a choose your own adventure kind of elective for them. And some of them spend more time with lactation, learning kind of techniques and skills and knowledge about that piece of it. Others do more clinical care or delivery room attendance. But we have kind of pieced together something that can be tailored to the resident's learning needs as an elective in the third year that's been pretty successful. It remains informal in our institution and, and other places have done it better. But what your um, question really made me think about remembering the tour this morning is your OB clinic is upstairs. So what if you could figure out on your clinic time, right, a way that at certain times or on prenatal days or when women are going for their ultrasound or something, you know, figure out a system that would work that you can plan a pediatrician up there in the prenatal visit and say, hey, Ms. So-and-so, you know, I'm going to be the doctor that takes care of your baby or one of my colleagues when she's born. I'd love to talk about your feeding plans or any questions you might have about your baby. A prenatal class um, in small groups you could do that way or one-on-one um, -on -one counseling depending because I mean, all you have to do is walk up the stairs and you've got these women as a captive audience. So I, I would encourage you to sort of talk to the folks in the OB department and see if there are ways to design something where you could you know, at least have one contact with moms at 30 weeks or something like that and, like you say, plant some seeds and do some education. It's a great question. How about other ideas or questions or challenges that you all have faced? We're reaching the limit of like attention span, I think. So, well, I'll hang around here for a little bit, um, but I thank you all for your attention and having me. It's been a pleasure.